Some of these are going to be very tactical, like things you need to just do and execute on. Others are going to be more strategic approaches. If you employ these, or even just a handful of them, I think you'll be able to stand out. This is the Work in Sports Podcast. Here's VP of Content and Engage Learning at WorkinSports.com, Brian Clapp. Last night, I'm recording this on Friday, as I often do for the Monday podcast, just the way the schedule works out sometimes. We can get it to you as early as possible on Monday. But I have to admit, last night, I love the NFL draft, and I'm a Patriots fan. Those two things, well, at least one of those things may make a lot of you upset. I'm from Boston. I'm a diehard Patriots fan. I have been my entire life. I've suffered through bad seasons, so not some bandwagon-y kind of guy. But I have to say, I watched the entire NFL draft stayed up until midnight and i have to admit it was a really disappointing experience i mean to go through the entire time of watching your team always trade back now i'm okay with trading back i think there's okay strategies that are involved there but going from 21 to go back to 29 to then pick a guard which i don't think any team in the history of the universe has said we're one guard away from winning a super bowl when you have a team that's devoid of talent and speed and getting old and needs to reload, and they not only draft a guard, but it was a reach guard, and I stayed up till midnight for it, and the Jets did really well overall. I, 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 it pains me to say it, but God, the Jets did a great job last night, and my team did not, and that hurts me to say, but I still love the NFL draft. It's fun watching the angst of all the fans and then – the little highlight packages, and I think the production is so cool. I think they do such an amazing job. I mean, it's like a Super Bowl level production. How many cameras they must have, how many graphics packages they must have, being able to jump from person to person on commentary. It's really an impressive production. So I was watching the ESPN broadcast, but because I'm such a dork, I also recorded the NFL Network one, and I might go watch that tonight. Let's see what those guys said. Daniel Jeremiah is a pretty smart guy. Anyway. This is a great time of year, as I keep mentioning. You've got the NBA playoffs, the Stanley Cup playoffs starting, the NFL draft, baseball in getting in, and the sun's starting to come out. So I'm, I'm in a pretty good mood for a Friday, despite the fact staying up too late and possibly looking a little puffy if you're watching us on the YouTube channel. Sleep will do that to you, or the lack thereof. Before we get into today's question, two cool jobs highlighted at the end of the show. Make sure you stay tuned for that as well. But now let's get into a question from John. In Georgia, doesn't say where in Georgia, I'm guessing Macon. I don't know why, just I've driven through Macon, Georgia before. Hey Brian, sorry for being blunt, but I'm getting kind of sick of all this job seekers market talk. It is harder out there than people think. Yes, there are opportunities, but there is also a ton of competition for sports jobs. In January, I was thinking, this is my time. And now in late April, I'm feeling a little depressed. If I get one more, thank you for your application, but we've decided to pursue other candidates, I'm gonna flip. I have experience, I have a good education, I'm raring to go and passionate. What else can I do to differentiate myself? Okay, John, this is a really good question. And I think it's important no matter what kind of market conditions we're in. You will hear right now that it's a it's a buyer's market, right? It's like a job seeker's market. There's more opportunities out there. Companies are looking to hire. People have left their positions. Opportunity abounds. But I'm hearing from more people than you'd, you'd probably acknowledge or probably realize that it's still pretty hard out there. And I get that. And, you know, even when times are, uh, it's really beneficial to the employer, I'll have people tell me, oh man, I'm getting tons of great offers. So it's never completely one way or the other. And no matter what, I still think as you compare the sports industry to other industries, the competition level is different because you get flooded with a lot of different people that just like the idea of working in sports. And that can cause a lot of noise that can sometimes help you get lost, not help you, force you to get lost. So Let's talk through some principles, and that's not just for right now. This is for your forever plan to stand out and differentiate. And, and as I like to give everybody you know, some, some context here, I share a lot of information and advice from my own experience, but a lot of the stuff I share too is pulling from those interviews I do as part of the show. I've talked to a lot of different people in this industry, and we often talk about what they look for. 
what makes somebody stand out from the pile. So I'm going to share some of those little nuggets in this conversation today because I do think there are some key things you can do to differentiate yourself. Some of these are going to be very tactical, like things you need to just do and execute on. Others are going to be more strategic approaches. But I think if you employ these, or even just a handful of them, I think you'll be able to stand out a little bit more, John, and that's what you're looking for. Because like you said, you have the experience, you have the education, you're raring to go, you're passionate. Now let's make sure everybody else knows that about you. And that uh, covers, that's for everybody out there listening. First slide, please. Number one, customize your cover letter. Customize it every time. Customize it to that employer. Now, that doesn't have to be a full-scale rewrite each time. But you want to make little things in there that make it seem like it's personal to this person you're applying with and talking to. I also would implore you to um, to go through a cover letter strategy and to think about how your cover letter and your resume are different from one another. The number one problem I see, I've repeated this many times in the show, so I won't go into too much depth, is people think their cover letter is a is a repeat of their resume in paragraph form. It is not. A, a cover letter is an opportunity to tell me a story that increases what I know about you from the resume. Your resume is going to be a lot of your tangible hard skills, and your cover letter may be an opportunity to tell me some of your soft skills and weave them into a story. So you say you have work ethic. You say you're passionate. You say you're a good leader. Show me. Tell me a story. Hook me. Make me interested in reading. Make me want to learn more about you so that your story now becomes complete for me. I see your resume and all those things you can do. And I read your cover letter and I feel like I know a little bit about more about you and your experiences. Customize a little bit for that employer. Make sure that story stands out and hooks somebody. I think one of the key differentiators is that most people take the cover letter as a throwaway uh, exercise. If you put a little more effort into it, that can help you stand out for the right reasons. Number two, Polish up your resume, and I'm going to give this a very exacting thing that I want you to do. You should have multiple versions of your resume. That is so important. You need to have a version that is what you use when you apply for jobs online. That is your scaled down in formatting, very clear, left to right, no columns, no images, no crazy fonts, just a very basic left to right. You can still use bullet points, still implore you to do that, but as left to right as you can because what the applicant tracking systems do is they pull out all the formatting, and if they do columns, it can make your whole resume seem like a jumbled mess. So you want to have a version that's pretty scaled down, utilitarian version of your resume. You want to have a really pretty version of your resume that is well designed so that if you hand it to somebody or if you're just emailing it to them, you're not applying to an online system, it looks really good and professional if you're posting it on any uh, job boards, et cetera. And then you want to be customizing it for each application. Each application. Yes, you heard me right. You want to make sure your resume is matching the demands of the job. If you just have one base resume that you don't adjust at all, that's being lazy in this process. Every job is a little different. Every job has different demands. Every job has different things that it's highlighting and needing. You might just rearrange some bullet points. You might add in an additional bullet point. You might take something out if it's irrelevant. You might just re-emphasize something or give it a little bit more depth or add some more data points to it. But taking that little bit of effort and making sure that this resume matches this job is really important and it takes more effort, but you want to get hired. You don't want to be depressed. You want to be hired. Okay. So now let's keep going deeper. We're starting kind of surface level things that I want you to do. We're going to continue to get layers and layer deeper. Number three. No, oh, number three. Quantify on your resume using metrics that show results and impact. Every job you've ever had, this is where you need to be creative, is on you to be creative. But you can do Google searches and look up ideas on this. I've shared a lot in previous podcasts, but I want you to have some data points on your resume. It's proof of concept. It's not just a fluffy action verb. It is really saying, this is the change that I've made. This is the things that I've done. So 
if you want to work in social media, it may be that you increase Twitter followers by 23% using a high touch campaign, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you're in email marketing, it may be increased open rates. If you're in finance, it could be reduced expenditures, you know, like all these different things by certain percentages, by certain numbers, year over year data points. Every job that you have, one of your bullet points should in- include some data. If you're in sales, it could be uh, number of calls uh, over quota or uh, you know number of leads generated. There's, there's plenty of ways to carve up data for just about any job. It shows impact. And it's really easy for anybody to identify with. You read it and you're like, oh, that's, that's impressive. It gives a good impression. So add some of that to it. Okay. Number four. The number of the day is four. Uh, uh. Create some online buzz. I know this this sounds a little bit out there, but I think this is an underused tactic. I think you need to take a personal approach to communicating what you are looking for and how you exemplify that online. So what I mean by that, your LinkedIn profile should be dialed in. Maybe have your own website with some of your more uh, portfolio work product type pieces on it. Utilize that to reach out to people and say on a very personal basis, what I don't want you to do is do some post on LinkedIn to your 10,000 followers saying, hey, looking for work. If you're looking for an aggressive, excitable, passionate sales guy, hey guy, call me. Like that reeks a little desperation. But if you go individually to people that you think are, um, Influencers know what's going on out there, connected, go directly to them, reach out, say, this is what I'm looking for. Here's my portfolio page. Create a little buzz around you and your your efforts to get your name out there can really make a difference. When I interviewed Lexi Ross with the Memphis Grizzlies, I love this about her. She had her own site. She had a lot of her portfolio, a lot of different campaigns she worked on. She had uh, links to articles that she had written. She had her resume online. It was really professional looking and gave out a good vibe. So now she put that on her LinkedIn profile. She shared it through uh, Twitter and other channels on there. So it became very easy to get to know her. So think about creating that extra thing for yourself. Number five, provide employers with portfolio or work samples. This is actually one of my favorite points. Okay. You might not be able to scale this, meaning you do it for every job application, but this is for that special few. If you have a certain dream organizations or dream jobs, this is where you go a little bit extra. And I'm going to quote uh, two different guests on the show who have talked about this. Brian Killingsworth is the CMO of the Vegas Golden Knights. Great guy. was on the show, I think, about two years ago. But I asked him, you know, how does somebody stand out to you? A lot of people want to work for the Golden Knights. How does somebody get on your radar? And he gave an example. He said that somebody applied for a job one time and they included in a report on why the Golden Knights should be involved in esports. Value propositions, revenue numbers, projections, impact, marketing objectives, the whole thing. Three-page document kind of thing. And maybe it wasn't as detailed as Brian might have to do in order to pitch it to the his CEO, but it was pretty impressive nonetheless. And this person stood out for that. I'll give another example. Louis Polis, who is the director of quantitative research for the Philadelphia Phillies. I think I got his title right. Basically, he's in baseball analytics for the Phillies. Another great interview we had on the show. I think that was also about two years ago. But he talked about how when he was in college, he wanted to work in analytics. So he put together a baseball analytics report for every team in Division I baseball and pitched it to them saying, this is the kind of impact I can make. Here's a breakdown of your team. Here are ideas. Here's strategies. Here's things you should be doing differently. And he got hired. He got hired by UAB, I believe, before he got hired by the Phillies. So sometimes you need to go that extra layer deeper in order to be impressive and stand out. Cover letter resume expected. A little extra personal brand, a little extra reporting, a little extra research. Nice change. Nice. Number six. We'll work up a number six on them. Number six. This is going to sound strange. Follow up. Why does it sound strange? Because either you're doing it and it feels natural or you're not doing it and you're like, wait, I should do that? Because I'm telling you, there's two camps on this. Some people, a lot of people are just like, I apply and then I wait okay, that could work. Might not though. And then there are other people that are like, oh no, I follow up. I'm aggressive. I go after it. I want this job. And I think those are the people that win more often than not. And matter of fact, when I asked Maylin Vu, who's the director of talent acquisition for the Cleveland Guardians, 
should somebody follow up with you or is that annoying? She's like, oh my God, yeah. I want somebody to follow up with me in the first, in the first week after they've conducted an interview. And you can do it after you apply for a job too. Find somebody that you can connect to and reach out to and say, I've, I've applied for this job, wanted to see what the latest information is, blah, 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 any advice for me, what's a timeline, anything along that lines. But after you've interviewed, absolutely 100% you should be following up. You want to make sure you're still on their radar. You want them to think about you and you want them to know you're still interested in the role. What surprised me was May Lynn, I mean, she's hiring for the Cleveland Guardians. I got it right this time. She's hiring for a role like that. And you would think like, she doesn't have to worry about people following up. Everybody's interested in working for your organization. It's a major league baseball team. And she's like, no, what happens often is we start to wonder if somebody's still interested anymore if we don't hear from them. Wow. So even major league baseball teams have some crisis of confidence, right? They're like, oh, maybe they don't want to work here anymore. Maybe they don't want to be a part of our organization. So reaching out, following up, making sure they know you're still interested is super, super important. Number seven. As we get set for game seven. Connecting with your network. Now, again, I want to be really clear on this. I started to touch on it a little surface level earlier, but I want to go a little bit deeper. I do not like the idea of mass announcing to everyone you know that, hey, I'm out of work looking for this guy. I'm here for you. Like that's not going to work. I think that reeks of desperation rather than any kind of personal touch. I don't think people respond to that or feel motivated to respond to that. But if you reach out to people directly that are in your network and you explain your situation and just let them know that you're looking for work and if they hear anything to let you know, I think that can really work to prime your network for opportunities. And you might find out that they're saying something like, oh, I got this friend over here I know is hiring. The sports industry is small. You know, we talk about this all the time. It feels like it's big. I mean, there are over 8,000 employers that posted us at workinsports.com and over 23,000 jobs. That sounds like a lot. But in the scale of things, it's really not. And a lot of people shift jobs in the, in the, in the industry. I mean, you look at me, I was at CNN Sports Illustrated, Fox Sports, and then I was at, uh, I've been at work in sports ever since. I mean, I've met a lot of different people that are out there in the industry. And then I talked to a lot of people as I was for our podcast. And all these people are like, oh, you know this person? Oh, you know that person? It's a really interconnected world. So once you start to be like personalized in your outreach, once you start to really talk to people that have a direct chain or, and can affect your ability to get hired and let them know what your situation is rather than some mass email, you turn on your network, you, you prime them, and then they become your advocates out there. But I think personal outreach is so much more important than some mass email to everyone. Final one. So you have Game of Thrones season eight for me? Yes, sir, I do. You're looking for ways to continually differentiate yourself. And the best way to do that is to improve your skills. And you can do that by continuing your education. I don't mean you have to go back and get your master's. That might be something you want to do. I don't have mine. So I'm not necessarily advocating for that right now. It's a very expensive choice. But I would say continue to research what skills are in demand for your industry and add to your skill set. Add to what you're known for. Learn Salesforce. Learn Photoshop. Learn Adobe uh, Premiere Pro. Things that are in your your career path. Don't just start learning random things that don't connect. But if there are things that are in your in your career path and you can explain why they're so valuable to what you want to do, and you can bring that up in conversations with hiring managers during the interview process, I think that goes to show that you're a continual learner and that you're curious and that you want to grow and that you have high potential and high ceiling. So continuing to add those things, take certificate courses, add them to your profile on LinkedIn, add them to your resume, Bring them into your conversations that you have during interviews. Leverage those things you continue to learn and improve upon so that you can have a cool new story to continually be telling. Always be improving. Mark Warkentin, who was a two-time NBA executive of the year with the Denver Nuggets and the Knicks, and he was with the Oklahoma City Thunder for a while. He always used to say, just 1% better than the other guy. Just be 1% better. And these ideas, John, these concepts or how you can get to be 1% better. Do 1% more than the other guy. There's eight ideas here. Do five or six of them. I think it'll change your tra tra trajectory. Words are hard. Got to pronounce that one. Got to work that out. So, John, I hope that gives you some good ideas. Everybody out there, it is competitive. I also want to give you a little bit of perspective, though. A lot of people that are applying for jobs in the sports industry go through 
they're our competitor, but they go through a free job board and they don't have any skin in the game. They just say, ah, I want to work in sports. I think that sounds like fun, but they may not be qualified at all, but there's no barrier to entry. They can just go and apply for free and see if magic happens. So a lot of times when you hear this number of 500 applicants, 700 applicants, 900 applicants from the talent acquisition people I talk to, only about 10 to 15% of the applicants are actually qualified and interested in the job. So your competition number is lower than you think it may be because there's a lot of people that are just applying because they're fans or it sounds cool to work for a team, but they don't actually have the requisite skill set. So don't let it intimidate you. Keep improving yourself and getting after it. John, great question. Glad we had this conversation. Thanks for listening to everybody. Uh, really enjoy having these conversations with you and seeing all your great questions come in. Please email me anytime. Bclap at workinsports.com with your questions. And we'll handle them on a show. You can DM us. You can share it on LinkedIn. You just let us know what your questions are. We're here to help. John and Georgia did it. Why can't you? We'll be back on Monday. Thanks for listening, everyone.